Welcome to this live streaming event hosted by Diamond Way Buddhism. Um, we're joined by Lama Ula Nidal, a Buddhist master and teacher for over 40 years. Um, he serves as a Lama to over 600 Diamond Way Buddhist centers around the world and spends his days traveling the world and teaching to thousands of students. Lama Ula is joining us uh, to talk about his sixth book, Buddha yes. and Love, um, which was recently released in English and uh, went on sale last week. Um, and it became the number one selling book uh, in Buddhism and relationships on its first day of release Man. on Amazon. Congratulations. I was amazed. <laughs> uh, so welcome and congratulations on your book. Well, thank you, thank you. We, we have quite a few books. We have five or six out in English and about ten in German and in, in Russian and Slav languages and so on. And we are gradually bringing them in here also. The next one will be Buddha and Death and uh, Fearless Dying, right, a subtitle and so mm -hmm. on. So we're trying to hit all the important points where we think that we can be useful. Because mm -hmm. Buddha, Buddhism and Buddha's teachings are not a faith religion, they are a religion of experience. And he doesn't just tell us it's like this or that, but he gives message to experience it, how it is, right, and so on. And this is also what's the meaning here for the text that we, that we have here, Buddha, Buddha and love, you know, that this is really... Uh, based on the experience of many, many people, also on modern science, on modern philosophy, on age-old philosophy, Tibetan ways of viewing the world, and of course, you know, all the different psychological things, you know, that are up in the time. Uh, well, speaking about that, so love, partnership, marriage, these are all dynamics that are you know, universal for yes, people. Sir. Um, and this book addresses these issues from a Buddhist perspective. So would you say that you need to be a Buddhist in order to benefit or apply any of the teachings that are in this book? No, but you need to have human feelings, general human feelings, and be also a certain level of goodwill and education and so on also in order to be able to use it. But if these things are there and we understand that we can only benefit ourselves by also benefiting others, right? Mm -hmm. That the, it's not a question like in a lot of modern books I hear, I don't get the time to read them, but I hear, you know, that it's a question of you, when you and your partner, it's like you're in a complicated relationship, you know, when you have to, and you know, you have to expect what you give and take and, and stuff like that. And here's Buddha's message is very simple, forget yourself, you know, I mean, Forget looking for anything, and if you do that, and you just think of benefiting others, then all kinds of bliss and meaning and richness appear like that. Actually, the whole idea, you know, this might be a bit for, a bit much for most people to hear, you know, but all the things we identify with, you know, whether it's our body and our thoughts and feelings, have no lasting duration, right? Mm -hmm. The bodies, they were born some years ago, then... They grow up, then at a certain time they get old, sick, and die, right? Mm -hmm. And thoughts and feelings come and go the whole time. So all the things which make us feel that we are vulnerable or that we need something for ourselves and so on, they dissolve when we understand that. Mm -hmm. Then we first understand that mind is essentially like space, that it's not a thing, that it has no weight, color, smell, size, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And good, then we are fearless because <clears throat> space cannot be harmed or destroyed. Mm -hmm. But then when we start from that level of fearlessness, then suddenly we are not the man going to the cinema hoping for a good film. Now we are the man owning the cinema, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it's not so important if the film is more or less good. Most important is there are no holes in the screen and that the projector works. Mm -hmm. So we begin to understand that our ability to be conscious is more important than all the different kinds of more or less pleasant experiences that come and go. And finally then, when we have this fearlessness and this joy and richness, then we understand the others are countless and I'm just one and they all want happiness. And then we try to do something for them. And what I gave here very shortly is generally the Buddhist view of love. Mm -hmm. So people want to be in a relationship because they want that happiness. They're, they're seeking for that happiness that yeah. they want to get from that relationship. Yeah. And so 
But Buddha teaches us that happiness that is based on conditions will ultimately lead to suffering. So can a couple's love transcend beyond temporary happiness and a source of suffering? Can it actually be a tool or a path to enlightenment? I actually think that I had an example of that in the life both of my parents and in the life also of my wife, right? Uh, where, where they both, you know, went beyond thinking of themselves, where they went beyond, you know, just trying to get something for themselves and really became altruistic, really went out and tried to help others and give them what they needed, you know, and simply made other people more important. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if I heard this formulation from them, you know, which I'm mentioning it often in my job as a Lama, that if we think of ourselves, we have problems, and if we think of others, we have interesting things to do, right? Mm -hmm. And this is t actually, you know, I would say this is an experience everybody can, 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 ex can try or can look for when we get out of our own little box of hopes and fears and tomorrow and yesterday and expectations and holding on and go out beyond that and really try to be useful in the big way for the world, you know, and so on, for others. And then this is a wonderful thing. It's real liberation. It's a very, very pleasant thing. And it's very meaningful. You know, speaking of that, you have a, you have a quote in the book that's really powerful. It's, um, true love without sticky attachment always yeah. has the taste of freedom. Yeah. And that word freedom comes up quite often in your yeah. book. Can you talk a little bit about the role of freedom in a relationship? Well, first, of course, the outer frame must give of society, must make freedom possible, right? Mm -hmm. There's one religion around the world, across the world, you know, which doesn't like the women to be free, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And this kind, you know, there it's already blocked from the outside. That's difficult. There must be a wide open frame which allows everybody to develop their potential, to show their faces, to take part in society, and so on. And if one has this outer frame, then inside that one can do a lot of very meaningful things, you know, like making each other's grow. Mm -hmm. I actually think, you know, most uh, strong men, you know, or famous men in history, you know, they have had definitely a mother, but maybe also some partners, you know, behind them, <sighs> you know, like that, <laughs> really, really. <laughs> who actually put them in that role and trained them and, and, and gave them the chance for that. So it can be done. And at the same time, you know, if a man shows really appreciation of a woman, mm -hmm. the way she blow, blooms, you know, and how beautiful she becomes mm -hmm. and how many qualities come up like that. Mm -hmm. You know, really, if we think of giving each other, you know, making each other grow, giving space, giving love and all this to each other, we can... We can all walk around like beautiful pictures in the landscape. We really can, you know, we can really give something good. Mm -hmm. Many relationship books work from this presumption that relationships should last a lifetime, and they talk about finding that one. Um, but in your book, you actually give advice about in certain situations um, that maybe a couple should break up, and, and even more interestingly, how a couple should break up. Can you speak a bit why it's important for a couple to break up, as you would say, in good style? Why is that important? Well, if we start, well, a life is, what is it now? It's somewhere between 70 and 80 years on average, right? Mm -hmm. And this time should be used for growing and it should be used for development. And if people maybe find each other because in a former life they did a good thing together, and then afterwards, you know, it comes up that they also did a lot of bad things, you know, so they couldn't function together and so on. Then in that case, you know, they move apart, which is others, everything good, make sure that next life again, where you will probably meet, that you can meet as friends and so on. Mm -hmm. But anyway, very much this thing that we, that we try to, you know, to minimize negativity, minimize bad, bad feelings and... and and give people a chance to, to find a new footing, a new standing, and so on. Which is also what we do in our cultures, you know, where people are free, like in our cultures, this happens more and more, right? Mm -hmm. if the women are kept as cattle, you know, of course, like in one, one culture, right? Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you can't do so much, you know, then, you know, there, yeah, then you have no chance. That incarnation is lost, really, right? right. But on the, other, on the other level, I would say that um, 
if there's freedom, you can choose we benefit each other, or we can choose to say, well, the jump is too big, you know, none of us can is able to make that far, you know, to go that far, right? And now we separate as good friends, you know, and, and we speak nicely about each other, try to do the best we can, you know, and hope that everybody is soon happy in another relationship, you know, with mm -hmm. somebody where it fits better. There's another quote that you have. Um, what one seeks from others is already inherent in oneself. Yes. How can this understanding affect someone who's actively searching for a partnership, who really wants to find a mate? How does that apply to well, them? Well, it's a quote from Buddha, so it should be good, right? <laughs> it's actually, you know, it's that we are actually all Buddhas who just haven't found it out yet. Mm -hmm. That the Buddha is also not like Santa Claus giving us something. A Buddha is somebody, you know, holding a mirror to us and showing us how, how precious our face is how many rich qualities we have inside, how much richness and power we, we contain. And then um, also gives the message how to experience that, that it becomes a part of our life, and really central and important. So this is an amazing thing, you know, if you, if you can really, you know, understand Buddha as somebody removing some hindrances from us to see our true face, our true essence, then this is much more hopeful than if we are thinking somewhere, oh, I hope somebody will give me something I don't have, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is, so this is uh, what's understood and that everybody has this Buddha nature, that everybody has immense potential, immense possibilities, things that can really be used and done, and then helping to get towards that. So sex. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> this book uh, deals with sexuality in a very frank and a very honest manner. Very um, Scandinavian way. <laughs> <laughs> From a Buddhist perspective, what is the role of sex in a relationship? And are there any kind of morals that Buddhism places on sexuality? Well, what, I mean, I think even old books talk about consummation of love, right? And that is where, you know, where the marriage really happens, right? And in some cultures, they hang out a sheet where they kill some poor chick, you know, and, and it's a sign that the lady was a virgin, you know, and so on, right? You find that in Europe, southern Italy, they do it, and places like that. So um, sexuality is definitely very important. I mean, there's an outer level of functioning that is, you know, being useful to each other, and there's an inner level, and that's the one of the good wishes and the, and the motivation behind. And then there's a the secret one, you know, which is the one of how we see ourselves and our partner, right? Mm -hmm. And there, Buddha advises us to see the female part as a lotus flower, something warm and wonderful that opens up and, and gives bliss. Mm -hmm. And the male part is a diamond, something powerful, you know, that, that really that transforms and, and brings this bliss and so on. Mm -hmm. So actually, lotus and diamond together, you know, this is the, the view of coming together. And here, of course, it, it is a personal thing, right? I mean, people who live together and don't share that, they do get a bit stiff or unhappy or frustrated and so on. Mm -hmm. While people who share this very deep bonding, you know, which happens at night in one's uh, married and loving life, you know, they will function really well and, and it'll be very joyful. So, I mean, this is something one should definitely look for. Something else is, you know, just having children all over the place. There, I would watch out, especially the poor countries of the world, you know. Mm -hmm. We give them money to have less children and we don't support them by having more children, right, because they're already overpopulated, right, they, mm -hmm. and they'll never get anything the way they live. Mm -hmm. right. um, so what do you see, um, you, you talk to, you have so many students around the world mm. and so many come to you with questions and looking for advice. Um, what do you see as the most common obstacle for most modern Western couples uh, in their relationships? I think that they, that they don't really see each other. You know, they have some ideas about some, some roles that, uh, that this one should do or that one should do and so on, but they don't see the totality of the other person. They don't look at the other one and say, listen, this is a human being, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'll try to be good to you and try, and these are the ways you can be good to me, right? And mm -hmm. let's start in that way, right? Let's start by thinking of what we have and what we can work with and the richness we have. 
And there, people often, they just have a picture of each other and thinking, okay, you'll do this, you'll do that, you know, and, and so on. And it's not a deal. It's not a deal. It's a question of, of, of developing one another, of giving one another happiness. Hmm. So, so like the old true. roles, you know, and so of course, ritual cultures, you know, like Asian cultures and others, you know, I mean, of course, this is, this is much stronger than with us. But also, you know, where a woman has these functions and she cannot do this, all the taboo cultures and so on that you have, right? Uh, also south of the Mediterranean already this start, right? Mm -hmm. There, of course, there are big limitations and so on. But also, um, also generally, you know, that people don't see each other and they, they just think that they're just not open enough to each other to really, to really start something. So here's something to shake them out of their habits, to shake them out of their cultural limitations and so on. This is a wonderful thing if that happens. And what advice would you give to a couple to help them shake themselves? I, I would say, you know, how, you know, uh, I would say to the man, you know, really try to find out what makes her happy. You're going to, you are now with her, you know, you... A part of you loves her, but you know at the same time you are not you are not doing everything you know that you could. So try to find out, ask her, find out what you can do that she wants, right? Mm -hmm. And and let her tell her what you want, and then make your basis, make your your um, the basis of your lives together. You know, on that ground, you know, on the on on that understanding that comes out there. So don't meet as people, as man and woman in a certain culture, a certain family, a certain background, right? But meet as, as total living beings and then say, listen, you know, I always dreamt about that, you know, that somebody would do this for me. or be, and, and she would say, you know, well, I always wanted to, you know, I had difficulty with that and now I would want to open up in this way and so on. And then really think of yourself or think of oneself as a, two-headed monster, you know, as my wife and I always th thought of ourselves, right? You know, I mean, where everything functions or, or is walking forward, right? Shoulder to shoulder when things go well and back to back when there are difficulties, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in this way, really get as much out of being a totality and being closely together as possible. This, I, I, I seriously think, is good. Many Buddhists strive to orient their actions to create the largest benefit for all beings. Yeah. Um, what is the result of applying this kind of motivation to someone's relationship, for that relationship itself, but then also for other people who are around that relationship? Well, a well-functioning couple is a wonderful thing to be with. It really is. You know, I mean, people who see that, I saw it with my parents, for instance, right? My wife also with her parents and Kathy with... with it's the same thing, and her use is so the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And all these different things, you know, a couple that functions, that are loyal to each other, that trust each other, that are kind to each other, and so, are simply a wonderful thing. I mean, there's something, my brother and I were not the nicest kids, you know, we made a lot of trouble cleaning out bars, you know, lots of fights, lots of trouble, and so on. But, mm -hmm. but you know, actually, uh, that we, our parents, you know, the way they took all that trouble, right, and, and the way they helped and everything like that, it was such, so exemplary, it was so amazing, right, how they did that. They were really, they were, you know, they were really, real solidarity, real friendship, real, real love also. It was very, very good. Yeah. So you see that in a couple, you saw that in my parents, you know, and that was a, uh, there was a thing, you know, that also came into my, my Hannah's and my life, right? I mean, we had a certain kind of family background, you know, where the man protected the woman and the woman did what she could for the man and everything. And that was also what, what, yeah, what we work with today. And you and your wife together established. Yeah, yeah, we did. Family. We did everything. I mean, you know, really, we were a two-headed monster. I was very good for the outer things, you know, for pushing things over, for all the rough things. And she came in, you know, and made a lot of very fine human connections with people and so on. It was, it was excellent. It was very, very good. Um, in your book, you cover the shifting circumstances when a love couple becomes a parent couple. Yeah. Um, 
In an American society today, there is this phenomenon of helicopter parenting, um, where a child becomes the consuming focus of both parents' lives and attention. Yeah. Um, but you present a contrary book in, uh, view mm -hmm. in this book. Yeah. You strongly stress that it's the relationship and the dynamic between mm -hmm. the couple that is the that should be their focus and foundation. Yeah, Why yeah. is that? Because children are, are small, noisy little things with a lot of ego and all kinds of other things. And if the parents don't stand together in the upbringing, you create a little monster, right? You do. I mean, one has to, with kids, you know, one has to tell them you're very nice, you're very sweet, you'll be, be very wise, you know, when you're 30, 40 years old, right? But right now you're a pain in the neck, right? I don't want you to be so noisy, you're not going to be so egotistical and so on. We have a job, you know, of, of bringing them up. Mm -hmm. What they don't learn when they're three years old, you know, will be a big character problem for them when they are 30 years old. No doubt about it. Parents have a duty to bring up the kids without anger, without disturbing feelings and so on, in such a way that people will like to be with that child afterwards, right? And what happens with a couple's relationship if their focus is just entirely on the child? I think they're just two people with a similar job then. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, they're two people sharing a job. Right. I don't know what else. Mm -hmm. This helicopter, that's a funny word. <laughs> really, really funny. You know? I don't think we have that in, 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 in Europe yet. But. Yeah. Um, you also write about people who repeatedly break off relationships once they hit a rough patch um, and then they go yeah. and seek someone yeah. else yeah. Um, and that they tend to see a lot of the same flaws coming yeah. up in their partners <laughs> over and over. Yeah. And you write that um, one does not see the world, well, but rather one's, one's own, own habitual yes, projections. It, um, so can you speak how to, that applies that's to That's probably the most important thing we've said so far in this interview, right? The fact that we don't see the world, we see our own minds, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we are happy, we see a pleasant world. If we are unhappy, we see an unpleasant world, right? And it can be the exactly same world, mm -hmm. exactly the same thing. We decide if we have on the dark glasses or the rosy glasses or maybe clear glasses, which is the best, right? right. So, I mean, this is, uh, we are not seeing the world. We are seeing our own states of mind, I mean, Okay, I've meditated for over 40 years now. I do think that now my mind doesn't change anymore. I do, I am seeing the world, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I look back, you know, to 20, 30 years ago, you know, and I was really seeing my own mind. I like this, I dislike that, and so on. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, they say, well, your mind is like the waterfall. Then you get a bit older and wiser. Your mind becomes like a flowing river. Mm -hmm. And in the end, your mind is like the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. It can take everything, handle everything, you know, take care of everything and without being disturbed in any way. Mm -hmm. And how does this, so if someone's seeing um, the projection of their own view or the projection of their own mind, how does that um, inform uh, maybe their experience when they're constantly, they're just breaking up with someone and they move on to someone else and they just think there's something wrong with these people. All women are the same or all men are the same. Yeah. How does that apply into that situation? Well, it applies into the fact that they probably uh, should maybe talk to a psychiatrist <laughs> or something, right? I mean, honestly, right? Mm -hmm. If one is not happy, I mean, uh, they probably have more time than then lamas have, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're paid, so it's, it's, they have more time, right? Mm -hmm. And so on. Uh, but, I mean, I would, if one sees a lot of problems and negativities with the world, mm -hmm. I would really see that as a, a, a serious flaw in one's own character. Mm -hmm. And I would say I, I should go and check that out, which childhood experiences were there. And if we cannot explain it with childhood, it must have been former lives, mm -hmm. right? I just find out, and I have a thing, you know, I have a thing that is really good, really important, really good. And, and that's the fact that if we discover in our life uh -huh. that we carry a certain problem like jealousy, greed, attachment, whatever, you know, and so on, then we should try to find out who we got it from. That's really important, you know. It's usually mother or father. It's usually something in the family. And then 
you know, there have been different ways. This has been discovered before, and people have used different ways with it. I remember something called somebody called Otto Mühl and the AAO, and in very, very, uh, very like say, very extreme group of people in in Austria and Germany in the sixties. So they were making dances where they were, when they had found out that they had a negative feeling from their mothers or fathers, that they would, uh, they would strangle them and stuff like that, and they made big dances out of it. I said they were very extreme, right? But you know what I found out is much better is you, you wish them so much happiness, right? Every time there's a lovely example, you think my mother have this, or my daddy have this, you know, and so on until a point comes where you subconsciously think, now they have everything. Now they're actually totally happy, and then you can let the trip go. Then you don't owe them anything more. They're happy, you know, everything is great, you know, everything is wonderful, and you let it go, right? Wow. Yeah, it's a much, much better than all this other stuff, you know. Just wherever the problem is, just fill it up with everything wonderful. Just throw everything nice at it, you know, until... You only see niceties, and then you say, work done, bye. Yeah, and it works. I tell you it works. I tell you it works. You write that down? Yeah. Um, so all conditional reality um, in this realm is impermanent, and this absolutely includes people's yeah. lives as well. Um, so even the most well-functioning, um, fulfilling, giving love partnership is definitely not a guarantee that one of the partners isn't going to die before the other one. Um, oh. And many people who are deeply in love with their partner would find this to be a very distressing thought. But you actually say that embracing this idea can actually strengthen the relationship. In what way? Well, when my wife, uh, well, when we discovered that my wife was you know, was had cancer, right? And we had talked to a couple of doctors and I had buttonholed them straight and I said, if this was your mother or your wife, what would you do? And they had all said, I wouldn't do anything, mm -hmm. right? It's there and there, you know, give her life, uh, give her the best possible life and the painkillers she needs, you know, and, 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 and go on like that. And this was then, and then, actually, there was a wonderful time. We were sitting in the next room, Katy and myself, writing a book, you know, and 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 it, while this happened, all the students and friends came to her, you know, and she lay in my arms every night. It was actually a, a, an amazing death, 1st of, February, uh, 1st of April, right? She actually died sitting in my arms. She was, you could see, she was a yogini, she was... Uh, told we had she was clinically dead uh, 15 times and we had three Buddhist doctors there you know who were checking it out German and Danish and they were checking out totally I mean absolutely totally dead no heart no heart anything and then it was like a minute or two or a bit longer afterward she had this idea maybe I can be useful and she started breathing again and the pulse went up to 70 and so on and also blood the feeling was up to 70, oxygen in blood was up, and then it went down again. And then the 16th time I was sitting there holding her, I said, and this is painful for you, now you go. And then I, hick, then I sent her out, sent her to a pure land, mm -hmm. sent her to a state of beyond personal bliss with the red Buddha of limitless light, you know, which mm -hmm. is where we have our contact. And, and that was it then. Then I, she lay all night. I kept her in, in my arms during the night. And in the morning, when we when we looked at her, she looked like she'd eaten something absolutely delicious. Like, you know, really like really, really gone, really, really touched by that. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And there, we usually advise people to to wait three days and nights because often the mind. When it dies, it, it stays with the body, right? Mm -hmm. And in her case, we burned her already the day after, or two days after, three days after. When was it, Caddy? Remember? Three days? It was three days. Okay, okay. For me, that period was, was something else, right? There was not completely normal experience and so on. But okay, but anyway, it felt so like... She felt like she was already gone. She was gone from that moment where I sent her out. Mm -hmm. It was very nice. 
So if our mindset defines how we perceive the world, how we were speaking about earlier, um, what's the one thing that anyone who's watching this could immediately do or adopt that could make a significant impact on their relationship? Just right now? understand that they can be dead, our partners can be dead tomorrow, and if we are not nice to them today, you know, we may not have another chance. I mean, the impermanence of everything, of our bodies, thoughts and feelings and so on, they are exceed that that factor is something exceedingly important and should really judge our relationship or really not judge, should influence our in relationship with others, right? Mm -hmm. This I definitely think that this is this is really important. If I'm not good to them today, I may not have another chance. And I also thought, you know, now I'm not much of a businessman or anything, but if I would if I would advise everybody, you know, from whichever big company it is and so on, if the, when they meet, you know, for a big, big decisions that they have, uh, that they have a, a yeah, piece of paper in front of them saying, this is not the last time we meet, right? Mm. And people really understand, you know, I mean, if you kick me now where I'm down, I will talk badly about you, and if I'm on top the next time, I'll kick you back, right? Mm that people really find out that all human relationships should be win-win. Mm -hmm. Either somebody, something material appears or something emotional is, is cleared and some good feelings appear and so on. But this, these two, that, that there must be something for everybody and there must be respect for everybody and there must be good feeling for everybody in the end. This is important. Mm -hmm. Also, now we talk about relationships, if relationships split up and so on, I think exactly the same thing. Always, you know, they should feel good, they should feel some, at least somewhat proud, they should feel accepted, you know, and then you go on from there. You talk also, um, on top of that, you talk a little bit about how if one um, views the other person in anger, then you can't, you lose all the wisdom that was gained through that relationship if you cut yourself off from yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, if we leave each other as enemies, all the things we learned in the period we were together is frozen in. Mm. And we will have to make exactly the same experiences with the next partner. Mm. That's really true. You know, it is, you know, because mm. that's where our hooks go into the world, right? That's right. where our hooks go in. And, you know, if, and if one place, you know, whatever they grasped, you know, falls away, you know, it, they will go for something else. Mm -hmm. We will try to get that again. So we must always say bye-bye, you know, with friendship, with good feelings, try to understand what we could learn here from this situation and what partner could learn and then go on like that. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, really important. You know, we've spoken quite a bit about how this book um, informs rela uh, readers how to develop the relationship from a Buddhist perspective. Mm. But on the flip side, this is also a book that explains Buddhism through the dynamics of relationships. It's almost Buddhism in action because it shows people how the teachings uh, manifest uh, through this prism that people have a lot of experiences with, yeah. which is love. Um, so do you think that this is a book not only a guidebook to love and partnership, but also a tool to explain Buddhism to people who just want to understand the teachings better? Buddhism is how we live. Mm -hmm. It's not a faith system. It's nothing like that. It's a religion of experience. Mm -hmm. Buddha gives certain parts of information and so on and tells us, you know, to look out if we can use it, what kind of results we get and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the way we live is Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if we live in a way that benefits everybody, that gives growth, you know, human growth on all levels, if we are doing that, then this is a Buddhist life, and it's an example of how Buddhism can be used. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, no, there's no difference there. The theory and the practice of Buddhism is the same. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was made by meditators, right? Right. So Buddha gave it on, and it's based on experience and not on belief. So, I mean, it would have to be like that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so I think, do we have questions? I think we actually, there's some people who are watching that have some questions okay, that yeah, they please, wanted to ask. Please, please, please do that. So can you give some advice on working with jealousy in a relationship? 
Yes, and there's, it's the same thing, you know. You think they may be dead tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if you think that, and you understand that everybody will be gone one day, then if people, you know, want some happiness and so on, you, how can you do anything more than say, may you be happy, may you find what you want, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and through this view of, of passing on, you know, and giving to others, giving a chance to find something that fits, this usually f brings about that one finds somebody else where it also fits better, you know, like mm -hmm. that. That this kind of openness and so on is very, very enriching, both for the one who feels free now, mm -hmm. as for the ones who make them free, because also their, their hooks into the world, their contacts with the world are on a completely other and much finer level after that. When attachment has been given up, then, you know, the reaching into the world is a wish to give growth, to give feeling, to give development and so on to people. And this is a completely other way of, of being involved with the world. Huh. So, you know, by giving, you get rich. It's always like that. Mm -hmm. You never get rich by calling, well, I must have, must have, right? You never do that. You get rich by giving, right? By really, you know, thinking, may everybody be happy, may everybody feel good. And space is richness. If we open ourselves by giving, you know, the whole universe will put things into us. Richness, happiness, meaning, joy, everything will come in and flow out and, and through us. And the feeling that things come th work through us and that we are able to, in this way, benefit others and give them richness and development. So mm -hmm. It is such a good feeling. It is so enriching, you know, just, you know, when the hair stands up on one's arms, you know, just, not the ladies, of course, right, but <laughs> us, right, us men. Yeah, so, so this is the best thing, you know, you cannot do anything better for yourself than giving freedom and happiness to others. There's no, no way to bring more good. The universe is endless, there's everything out there. If we make ourselves into a channel or a tube through which it works and goes, reaches to others, you know, we will always be full ourselves. Hmm. Yeah. Um, another question that came in, many people struggle to find a compatible partner. We may wonder if we're being too picky or if we should wait for a good connection. What's your advice? I think f don't promise anything, but try to meet people where you think you can be useful for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, that you can be useful if you, that you can give, make them happy and be good for them, then you see how, how far it leads. But the lady, the elderly lady or the pregnant lady, you give your chair, you know, in the bus and stuff like that. And all these different things, you know, these are wonderful acts, mm -hmm. you know. And, and if we work on with that, on that level of making ourselves rich, making the universe rich and so on, you know, then we are actually doing something, then we are make, we're doing the best we can. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful, you know. I mean, if we make ourselves poor, I must have this, it must be mine, I expect this, you know, and so on, then we're just building a prison around ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we think, well, can I give, you know, what is possible, you know, may, I, may everybody be happy or whatever else, then that really works. You quoted a, um, a Crosby, Stills, Nash song uh, in your book. If you can't, can't be can't with the one, one you, you love, love, love the, the one, one you're with. with. Right there. So do you think that, um, do you think that people's sort of um, stiff ideas of what an ideal is can possibly get in the way of them actually being able to make a meaningful connection? No, I think, you know, I mean, there are certain things. I mean, for instance, for, for one's nightlife, one should be in love, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise it's just like gymnastics, you know, somewhere, you know. <laughs> it's, there should be some love, there should be some attraction, there should be some happiness, right? Mm -hmm. This is clear, but everything else, you know, uh, then I would say, you know, just, yeah, yeah, think of what you can give and, and, and also if you don't think maybe the gift isn't perfect, maybe the receiver isn't perfect, then still the fact that we try to do it, you know, that we try to be useful is really important. Mm. So, yeah, you'll meet them next life, maybe they are in a really good position, you know, and you can meet them again and you can just say a few words to them and, and all the potential grows up and they become very useful. Mm -hmm. 
Your book talks about the great qualities of men and women. One of our viewers is asking, as a young man, what advice do you have for me? What should I try to bring to this world? First, give women protection. That's the most thing, you know. Women have, never forget, women have 10 times stronger inner lives than we have. They have much stronger feelings and so on. We have all the ideas, but they have all the emotions, you know, and they are, because of that, you know, our first thing must be always in a relationship, treat the woman well, be kind to her, you know, give her security and everything like that. And with, on that basis, then she can unfold all her power, all her qualities. But in a cold atmosphere, you know, women just become half of what they could be, you know, and it's not nice. And the frustration and pain and so on comes up. So every man, I've always felt like protector of women. This would be my, my main thing. When, I, when I've seen people mistreating women or something, I've gone right in, you know, every time, <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things, you know, I, I don't like with Islam is that they treat their women like that, right? I mean, it's actually shocking. Yeah. What about for women? Yeah. Your advice for men is, you know, the first yeah. thing, go in and, and protect women. What about for a woman? What should women Think do? of women like men to like raw material to be developed, right? <laughs> not naturally in their own, not necessarily in their own wish, uh, for their own sake, you know, and then but generally, as, as raw material, that men have all this power, they have all this playfulness, they always put things on their head to see if they can produce more energy like that, and mm -hmm. so a few more horsepower or whatever else, like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see a man, you know, well, see him as a, maybe as a lover, it's nice if that's there, right? Mm -hmm. And also as a brother, you know, as a father sometimes, you know, or as a son, right? Mm -hmm. And if you see the man like that, you'll probably find all kinds of qualities where you can add something and share your experience and so on. And that's very good. Okay. And if a man then can see the woman as a sister, a lover, a mother or a daughter, right? Like that. And again, you know, we have all the different aspects. What does it mean to make a commitment to a partner? And what are the benefits of marriage, for example? Marriage is excellent because it keeps people together, you know, and, and uh, the small confrontations that may happen, you know, in different ways with old ideas and habits and so on, they can't do so much. It has to be a major problem before one begins to throw things up in the air and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is very useful. Mm -hmm. I think like this, it's stabilized. Also, women are very happy about marriage because it gives them a chance to fulfill their biological need, you know, to have children, right, and all this. And there I think also one should, one should really, the, the husband should really uh, try to give women that. Actually, actually it's quite funny. I, I, sometimes some men don't want the children, but they want the women, right? And there, you know, it's often, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling them when they come together and they talk about this and I would like and the man doesn't really know and stuff like that. And I say, if she wants a child, give it to her. Otherwise, she will have a house dragon in 10 years, right? <laughs> really, because if one frustrates that very deep thing in a woman, you know, one is really just pulling it along until she is 46 and doesn't think of and mm -hmm. thinks she cannot have kids anymore and stuff like that. If you do that, if you keep pulling that deep wish, you know, out, then it's really dangerous. Mm. So be honest, you know, if you don't will, if you won't do it, then be honest and say, okay, bye-bye, right? Mm -hmm. And if you are willing, then better do it fast than, than slowly. Also because then you have the chance of kids becoming your friends, right? Hmm. and so on and this was you know this was this is an amazing thing you can grow up with them they can be your friends you can develop on like that and yeah this is a good chance while otherwise if the parents are very old then you know it's just a few years one shares and then the parents are off to the graveyard right and mm -hmm. uh, and one couldn't do everything one wanted uh, another question um, how can we really open up to one another in an intimate relationship without becoming too attached? 
Well, again, you know, we, we touched on that already, you know, by, by wishing happiness for the other one. Mm -hmm. If there is the feeling of fulfillment, you know, I've done my best, it's doing really well and so on, then it's never, you know, then one never gets tight. If one is always keeping something, oh, I must also get that, or I must have that, you know, and some, some unfulfilled feeling of something else that should happen or some other experiences that should come and so on then one will never find peace. But if one goes in and does whatever one can, you know, fully and completely, right, day and night, then there'll never be, then you'll always be, be relieved because you did your best, right? Mm -hmm. And if we do our best, that's it, right? Then mm -hmm. there's nothing else, right? We did our best. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we don't do our best, if we have this idea and I can do this, and I can do that and all these different things, then it's something else. Mm -hmm. But doing your best, you did your best. You entered with honor, you can leave with honor, right? Mm -hmm. Like that. And others will want you also, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Another viewer asks, I always seem to have brief connections in my love life. How can I open up to a long-term relationship? Mm. I mean, you mentioned that, and that is probably that you didn't have very strong and, and lasting relationships from before. If you meet somebody you have a long relationship with, you know, you will feel it. Mm -hmm. And it will probably, again in this life, be, be, become long. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you were a nomad in your last life, then of course this is, yeah, what to say, you know, you're a nomad, you'll probably be a nomad in this life again, unless you decide, you know to go the extra mile, to do a bit more, mm -hmm. to, to, to benefit and, and attract people and so on. And then you can also build something on from what you do in this life. Mm. Well, I want to thank you, Lama Ola, yeah, for making the time and, and sitting down and talking with one. us.